Running Aces Casino and Racetrack is the Twin Cities' premier choice for exciting entertainment. 24-7 gaming and dining, monthly comedy shows, and $1 blackjack with no commission or ante, making it the most player-friendly casino around. Trout Air Tavern at Running Aces offers Minnesota-inspired handcrafted dishes with locally sourced ingredients and the trout that made the area famous. Running Aces Casino and Racetrack, 25 minutes north of downtown. Visit runaces.com. Running Aces, your night out is waiting. TCL is a proud sponsor of the 1500 ESPN Studios. TCL, America's fastest growing TV brand. For those who simply can't get enough talk about the Vikings, we present Bonus Chatter. Bonus Chatter about your favorite team that's unscripted, unfiltered, and uninterrupted. This is another edition of 1500 ESPN's Purple Podcast. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Purple Podcast. Matthew Collar here and joining me, my O-line guy, as all of you know him, Brandon Thorne. Brandon, how are you? I'm doing good, Matt. Um, I'm really excited to be doing this at the start of the season. You may know Brandon's work from USA Football and other various outlets. Uh, Some of the work that you're doing recently, Brandon, is super cool where you break down different techniques. And I got to tell you, I've mentioned this to you before, but offensive line play is one of those things where once you start watching for it and once you get an idea of what you're supposed to be looking at, it's kind of addicting. Like I end up watching offensive line play so much more because you have pointed me in the right direction on a number of things. So I want to talk with you on this podcast about Pat Elfline and his potential to return. Now, I don't know at this moment if he's going to return or not this week, but that return is imminent. It's coming. So before we get to Elfline, we can, I think, learn a lot about how good he is by what they had in his place this last week, which was Brett Jones. And I thought that Brett Jones did an admirable job and ultimately might end up starting at left guard. That's unclear whether it's going to be him or Tom Compton. But when you look at Brett Jones, Brandon, what do you see in him? Because I I think of him as a guy that is an admirable fill-in and seemed to be able to hold his own in pass blocking, but is way different than Elfline when it comes to his athleticism and mobility. Yeah, I mean, I think you just hit it on the head there. You know, he's a he's a backup. You know, I think it, you know a solid backup at best. And I think you saw that you know last week in that game with the Vikings. Um, you know, consistently struggled um, in space to climb to the second level and actually cut linebackers off in time. Um, just kind of a sluggish athlete. You know, I would say he's just below average at best in that regard. And you know, Elfline on the other hand is definitely above average, if not a little bit better than that. So. Uh, quite a drop off, you know, and I, I think predominantly in athleticism and play speed. Um, but again, I mean, even in play strength, um, I think that there's a drop off there as well. So pretty much all around is just kind of an all around drop off. But I think the most pronounced traits are athleticism and play speed for sure. So in, in year one with Pat Elfline, I thought we saw a guy who went from a very good prospect and made a nice debut for himself. By the end of the season, though, I thought he was fully into the game, especially when he was healthy and looking confident. And as I was watching film back for this, I looked at a game against Washington where I thought he was one of the most dominant players on the field. And what you see from Elfline, Brandon, that I really love Mm. is his ability to, it seems like, zero in on his target, whether it's a linebacker safety corner or even if it's you know nose tackle three technique no matter who it is and he gets there so quickly i mean is that kind of what you're talking about with the play speed where he there seems to be no hesitation in his game whatsoever he's off the line really quickly because when you look at his 40 yard dash or whatever it's not all that impressive but on the field it looks a lot different yeah, I, again, you know, I couldn't agree more. And I think, you know, when I, when I talk about play speed, it, it's a function of athleticism and mental processing. When those two things merge, you get play speed. So, you know, with Elfline, I think he's an above average athlete, but I think he's very smart on the field. So that kind of equates for me to, you know, good to very good play speed. 
Um, but I think partly why he can align his targets so well in space is not so much his athleticism, which is good enough, but it's his ability to read defenders in space and very quickly to take really precise angles, you know, to not overrun or undershoot guys. Um, you know, so I think, you know, how smart he is plays a big role on what he could do in space, you know, identifying the right target as well. You know, the, the, the most dangerous man, you know, not getting a guy that's not going to affect the play and things like that. So, you know, consistently making the right decisions, um, you know, and then having just enough athleticism to execute it, I think is what you see. And I, you know, I go back to, uh, Travis Frederick, you know, I posted something a while back on him. He had the slowest 40 time in the NFL for centers, um, last year. And even I think I posted in 2016, you know, the slowest guy by 40 time in the NFL at center, but probably the best space blocking center after Travis Kelsey in the league. So it, it definitely doesn't, you know, athleticism is definitely not the gauge you want to look at. Combine athleticism is not the gauge you want to look at for, you know, effectiveness in space. I think there's a lot more to it. And Elfline has some of those more nuanced traits to his game for sure. So last week we saw the Vikings throw to Delvin Cook a number of times. I think the happiest guy to see Pat Elfline back, aside from Kirk Cousins, will be Delvin Cook, not just because Elfline is strong in the run game and, and I think can handle himself against those great interior defensive linemen that the, uh, that the uh, Packers have if he returns this week, but also when it comes to those screen passes you mentioned in space, but how exactly does a center specifically impact the screen and short passing game? Yeah, I mean, you know, the screen game, you know, if the center does wind up going out and not just the tackle and guard, I mean, he's the one who most oftentimes from what I've seen on screens is when the running back cuts back upfield, you know, towards the middle of the field, the center is usually the one who's blocked that he's actually cutting off of you know, because he's the furthest inside. Um, so I think really he set the alley, you know, for the running back to have a, you know, a lane upfield, you know, in the cutback. So, you know, I think that's the, the main thing, you know, for running back screens at least, and even wide receiver screens, you know, to a lesser extent. Um, but yeah, his ability to, you know, cut off defenders and wall off defenders in space, you know, we, we saw it plenty of times last year. And yeah, I, I, I agree, you know, Dalvin Cook has got to be, ecstatic about that because he's somebody you want in space for sure and elf lines you know his his best friend in that regard there's also a, a huge difference to me in the leadership that they will get back and, and that's not to criticize brett jones but the guy showed up here like 10 days before the regular season it's pretty hard to take an offensive line room and make it your own uh and, and lead the quarterback and things like that right. who you literally just met so as much as i think brett jones is a smart guy and seemed to handle himself okay with elfline i think by the end of last year what we saw from him is that he was taking over that offensive line riley reef is the guy who's been around the grizzled veteran that brings all the toughness in the world and the work ethic to it but can you kind of explain how the center is just on a different level when it comes to his importance and his leadership from a lot of different you know, positions on the offensive line or just on in the offensive in general? Yeah, I think you, you know, you have to start with the the load that he has mentally, you know, coming into each game, you know, oftentimes the center, you know, in conjunction with the quarterback, you know, especially with a veteran quarterback like Kirk Cousins, I'm sure that they're both going to work off each other in terms of identifying defensive fronts, identifying the Mike linebacker, um, you know, that pre-snap communication between the center the quarterback and then the center and the rest of his line mates, he's kind of the hub, you know, for the rest of the offensive line, you know, calls go from the inside out. So everybody else's responsibility is predicated on what the center and quarterback determine, you know? So, um, yeah, it's going to be interesting to see that dynamic, you know, build throughout the season with him and cousins because, you know, cousins is the veteran, but Elfline is such a, you know, a heady smart guy that he could probably handle a lot of it to free up cousins, you know, for other responsibilities, but I'm sure they'll work hand in hand, you know, and, mm -hmm. and probably go back and forth on different calls and stuff like that. And, you know, um, that's going to be fun to watch. And that's critical, you know, as the season progresses, that relationship between center and quarterback. But I think really, you know, what makes center so special is they're the ones that all the, all the other offensive linemen and even tight ends, running backs, fullbacks, are depending on for what they're supposed to do on a given play in terms of blocking, 
you know, especially in the run game, but pass game as well. So yeah, center, um, they're just, they're just on a different level. And, you know, like I said in that article I wrote recently for USA football, really the quarterback of the offensive line is a, is a fitting name for, for that position. So I could see an argument for the Vikings bringing him back because of who they have to face with, uh, Kenny Clark and Mike Daniels and Muhammad Wilkerson. I mean, those are, those are a couple beasts. I could also see an argument for getting Elfline a, a tune-up game against Buffalo and then going out to play against LA and then going to Philadelphia. It seems to me, Brandon, tell me if I'm wrong, but there are more beasts on the interior of defensive lines around the league than I can ever remember where you go from team to team to team and it seems like you're always matching up with somebody who's one of the best players in the league. And maybe that's just how it feels because of the Viking schedule. But starting this week with Green Bay, tell me about what Pat Elfline is going to go up against if this is indeed his first game coming back. Yeah, so truly defensive tackle, the interior defensive line right now in general in the NFL. I said it at the end of last year when I watched all of them. You know, it was the deepest position in, in the game. And I think, you know, it's just only getting deeper. But specifically with uh, Green Bay, I was very high on Kenny Clark. You know, January of this year, when I finished watching every guy, I had him in the top 15 overall um, of defensive tackles. Um, Mike Daniels was a 3-4 defensive end for us, but still he's essentially a three technique. So I watched him on my own. They're both, you know, elite players for sure, especially against the run. You know, Kenny Clark, um, I think offers maybe a little bit more in the pass game, but in terms of running game, I mean, I, even with elf line back, you know, it's not like he has, you know, a couple stud guards next to him, you know, to, to double team with. So I, I don't foresee a lot of movement being generated against the Packers. Um, even if elf line's back, um, just because Kenny Clark and, and Mike Daniels, man, I mean, they're so strong. They play so low to the ground with such great pad level. They're very good with their hands. They're just very difficult to get your hands on, you know, as a, as an offensive lineman. And, um, you know, when you do, you're, you're really not going to move them much. So yeah, it's, you know, it's going to be a, you know, the NFC North, um, just with the interior defensive lines, you know, minus Detroit, they're kind of an outlier, but the other three teams, I mean, they're just incredible, you know, with what they offer on the interior defensive line and Green Bay is going to be a very, very tough matchup on the interior well you touched on one of the things that i wanted to ask you is just how much the guards impact the center because mike remmers you and i did a tape breakdown of mike remmers in the off season and we thought you know i i think he'll be okay there at right guard and i did not think he had an okay first game i thought he struggled quite a bit in his first game at, at right guard and rashad hill held his own but we're not talking about any of the elite edge rushers we'll run into them a little later in the season and then on the left side Tom Compton was better than expected at times but also got worked by DeForest Buckner at times how do you think that this thing shuffles out and how it could impact Elfline's return yeah well I think the two guys you know you have to talk about are the ones we have been talking about and that's Kenny Clark and Mike Daniels you know they're the best defensive linemen on the Packers team um, you know, we'll see about Wilkerson if he can kind of, you know, regain, regain that 2015, 2014 form. Um, I think that's, you know, remains to be seen. I know he had a, you know, a couple of good snaps last week, but, you know, really Kenny Clark and Mike Daniels and those guys are playing, um, you know, from the three technique. So that outside shoulder of the guard and in. So really, I mean, it's the guards in the center that are going to have to block those two. And, um, I, I think, you know, when you're talking about double teams or combo blocks, I mean, the guards are critical to the center's performance. You know, I mean, you know, you know, it's, they're each basically taking the same man on combos and doubles. So, you know, it's kind of a 50 50 proposition most mm -hmm. of the time. So if the guards aren't holding their own, the center's going to look worse and vice versa. So, um, yeah, I mean, you know, DeForest Buckner is an elite defensive tackle. Um, I thought so last year. And, you know, when you have a guy like Compton, you're solid at best, you know, elite and solid, that's a few tiers away from each other. So you're going to see what you saw, I think, again, this week, because I think both these guys are elite. So I would I would expect three or four big plays from probably each of them. Um, you know, I just think that's the way it's going to be. I'd be shocked if that didn't happen. And that's just that's what I'm expecting. So I saw you did a uh, Twitter video of Khalil Mack and the different things that he brings as a pass rusher. Now he's in the division with the Minnesota Vikings. Yeah. And I noticed from watching the game the other night, 
because now I, I'm always looking at the trenches because of you, Brandon, uh, that he lined awesome. up. Yeah, isn't it? He lined up on the right side, the offense's right side, almost every play, which kind of caught my eye because he moved back and forth when he was in Oakland. And, and maybe that's just because it was kind of his uh, first time with Chicago. But I keep thinking about Khalil Mack going up against Rashad Hill potentially here. What is it that, that makes Hill uh, – I'm sorry, what is it that makes Mack – so nasty as a pass rusher. Yeah, so in Oakland, he predominantly did play on that side. You know, he did switch, and I think you'll see him switch as he, you know, kind of rounds into form and, you know, gets into good, you know, football shape as the season goes on. But he's predominantly over the right tackle. And, yeah, I mean, um, you know, I think you have to start with Khalil Mack. I mean, his get-off is, you know, very good. You know, not quite like Vaughn Miller, you know, Everson Griffin, I don't think, but it's definitely very good. Um, and I think that's what sets up his speed to power, you know, and that's the number one thing I think with Khalil Mack that separates him from maybe every other guy in the league. You know, I know Everson Griffin is one of the top speed to power guys, Cam Jordan. Um, but Khalil Mack's ability to, um, stress the edge of an offensive lineman and then all of a sudden go straight down the middle of them and convert to power. It's devastating. And you, you know, Eric Fisher is the poster boy for that. I mean, you know, Khalil Mack you know, lifted him off his feet and, you know, sent him airborne several times, you know, throughout their matchups. And he has the ability to do that to mostly everybody. I mean, if you, if he just gets your hips opened up a little bit too much to the sideline, he's going to convert that down the middle and just put a guy on his back. And I think, you know, Rashad Hill's a great candidate for that to happen to. Um, so, you know, speed to power for sure. And, you know, he has a, a long arm. Um, pass rush move where he uses one arm to kind of create separation and get into the chest of offensive linemen. And that allows him to, you know, gain control and kind of go inside or out. Um, you know, and he has a couple other moves, but I think, you know, really his power is devastating. Um, and he also has that ability, you know, because of that get off to win the corner. So, he, you know, that's what makes him elite. He can win outside or inside or straight down the middle. So offensive linemen can't really sit on one thing. You know, they always have to. They can't really ever, you know, go into a rep and say, yeah, this guy wins mostly this way. So I'm going to set this way and, you know, kind of be ready for it. He just keeps guys on their toes. And, um, yeah, he's just, <laughs> he's a menace. So I was, uh, watching the University of Buffalo play Ohio State. Year, oh, that game was incredible. Years back. And now let me tell you though, Brandon, my expectations for Ohio State versus Buffalo were pretty low on the uh, University of Buffalo side. And all of a sudden, Khalil Mack just starts mauling whoever their left tackle was and getting in the backfield on every single play. <laughs> it's like, wh I've never seen a player for the University of Buffalo do anything like this. And the way that his stock rose was an incredible to watch. I, I've just never seen anyone at that Mack level just completely take over a game against an opponent that has all five-star recruits, basically, and and, and annihilate them single-handedly. And, and he kept Buffalo in the game. And since then, the guy has done exactly the same thing as he's gone along. And uh, now having him in the Vikings di division, along with Akeem Hicks, who is a heck of a fun guy to watch if you like offensive and defensive line play, because in the first half of that game against the Packers, he annihilated them too. So it's going to be a huge, huge challenge as the Vikings offensive line goes along. I thought that they passed their first test with like a C, and then now where it goes from there, uh, we'll have to be watching this entire time. Last thing for you, Brandon, Sheldon Richardson's addition. I don't know if you watched the Vikings defense all that much when you've been going through your all 22, but he was, I think, the best player on the field on Sunday for the Vikings. And it looks to me like if he's back to what he was maybe two, three years ago, if that's how he's going to play now and still clearly in his prime, then I don't see how the Vikings don't have a top three defensive line. They probably did already, but they might even be number one if he continues to play like that. Yeah. So Sheldon Richardson was a guy who personally I ranked uh, seventh overall in defensive tackles last year. I don't know if that jives with PFF or the common consensus, you know, whatever on him. I mean, you know, a lot of people from what I've seen is have said that, you know, last year wasn't what 16 and 15 were, but to me, I had him above Sue, above Buckner, um, above Clark, above, you know, a ton of people, you know, that other people may not have. 
and I don't know what his numbers were because I was just studying his traits. But yeah, last year he was phenomenal. Um, and I, I did watch the defensive line quite a bit. Um, last week I posted a couple Richardson clips as well of the things that he was doing. I mean, the same exact things I saw last year, basically. I mean, he has a repertoire of uh, pass rush moves, um, to, to, to go to. He always has a pass rush plan. So I think late in the rush, he's special, you know, in terms of if his first pass rush doesn't work and it gets stunted or thwarted from the offensive lineman, he immediately goes to another one. He always has that plan, you know, and he could string together multiple moves in the same rep. And that's what makes him special as a pass rusher. But I mean, the thing maybe that stood out more than anything to me about him was his pursuit in the run game from the backside of runs. And I saw it on Sunday. There's actually a, a clip I didn't post of him doing that to where, you know, the offensive runs outside zone away from his side of the field. And he knifes through the backside, you know, between the guard and the center of the guard and the tackle and pursues the ball from the back and makes a tackle. That type of stuff right there, um, I think, is really what makes him special, too. Not a lot of defensive tackles really even put forth that sort of effort to do that um, or have that sort of closing speed. Um, but Richardson has all of that. So, yeah, I mean, in my mind, he was elite last year and. You know, I, I agree with you, um, you know, in terms of the Vikings defensive line, you know, I said before the season is Jacksonville, Minnesota and Philly. I mean, and, and then everybody else in terms of defensive lines. And, you know, um, yeah, I think the, the guy who's really making a difference is Hunter. I think, you know, based on what I saw last week, I mean, you know, granted, you know, the competition he was going against was really bad, but I mean, he destroyed whoever they had at right tackle, which was multiple guys. And, and I think if he takes the next step, Oh my gosh, look out. Cause yeah, uh, I mean, he's already, you know, good, but he's, he's the guy, I think of all the guys that's really on the rise there. But, but anyway, yeah, I mean, elite defensive line either way. Yeah. No, I, I agree with you on Hunter. And from what we saw in the preseason, I believe, and I'll, I'm guessing a little bit on the stat that he had something like 30 pass rush reps in preseason games and created pressures on 10 of them or something. It was just like uh, outrageous what he did. Good. Yeah, he he sacked Blake Bortles with one arm where he just got his hand on Bortles and threw him to the ground. It's kind of like an old school Lawrence Taylor type of move. And it does seem like, you know, it's so easy because the guy just signed a long-term contract to forget how young he is, that he's only 24 years old and that he's still continuing to develop. And if he is fully turning that corner, then holy cow, is this defensive line unstoppable. And and with Richardson, yeah. It was fun to watch Richardson get into the chest of some of those linemen. It's it like, right. as far as packing a punch, you saw them flying backwards like you were describing with Khalil Mack. It wasn't just once. It was three, four, five times where he just exploded so much off the line that the lineman was in Jimmy Garoppolo's lap. Right. And then he has moves to, to you know, um, six, you know, to follow up with after he does that. You know, it's not just, you know, a lot of guys just – you know, throw an offensive lineman back and then they kind of stop. But he has those moves to string together that really make him special. So, yeah, power as well, like you said, he he has it all. Yeah, and uh, at the end of the game, he's the one that's in the backfield as Garoppolo is throwing the uh, interception. It was kind of funny that and, – and, and I like Harrison Smith as much as anybody in the NFL, so it's not to take away from him, but – uh, Harrison Smith wins defensive player of the week. And it's like, uh, you know, I think Sheldon Richardson just from that game alone had a better argument than even Harrison did when he got a sack, a fumble and uh, an interception. So, um, well, you know, line play, you know, it's always, you know, usually the line is who other guys do it on top of, you know what I mean? They do it off their backs, you know, and that's, you know, that's just another case of it, I think. Well, you're you're biased though, Brandon. You are. Uh, I don't know. You're extremely biased toward the offensive defensive line. <laughs> I am, but I mean, <laughs> still, you know, you never hear these guys in consideration for awards like that. You know. But oh yeah, right. yeah, sure. Right. If you don't get sacks, which is it's funny because after watching the game back, I went, "Oh my gosh, this is like one of the best performances from that position that I can remember." And you know, he ends up with zero sacks, but every single play he's making an impact. So, you know, it's right. not going to be judged from the outside on what he did for just impacting the game overall. It's probably, did he get sacks? Did he cause turnovers? That sort of thing. So that's how it goes. Right. Anyway, well, Brandon, as always, phenomenal stuff. Great to catch up with you. And um, 
It's unclear. It is unclear whether Elfline is coming back. So I don't want to make it sound entirely. Just wanted to clarify that. Right. That it might not be this week and we will see. But uh, very excited to have him come back so we can break it down more in the future, Brandon. So we'll talk to you again soon. All right. Sounds good, man. Thanks. And as always, we appreciate all you crazy people who love hearing about offensive and defensive line play here on the Purple Podcast. This episode presented by Minnesota's very own Ticket King. If you're looking for tickets to a game or concert, visit TicketKingOnline.com or the link on the 1500 ESPN Sports Calendar page. Seats to fit every budget at all venues and all stadiums with zero fees added at checkout. Visit TicketKingOnline.com or call 612-341-4141. Time is running out to get out of harm's way. I'm Tim McGuire with an AP News Minute. Millions of people in the path of Hurricane Florence are frantically preparing for a monster storm that's anticipated to make landfall tomorrow night through Friday afternoon. Like many others, Michael Barnes in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, is torn about staying or leaving. So right now, we're, me and my family, we're going to try to ride this thing out and see what we can do. Um, I was thinking about moving, you know, not moving, but heading down to Florida. I have a couple people down there that I can stay with, so we'll see. Just have to play it by ear until tomorrow. National Hurricane Center says Florence, which has weakened a bit to 115 miles per hour, top sustained winds, remains a dangerous storm, life-threatening storm surge, and rainfall expected. Deputy Director Ed Rappaport. The hazards will be increasing. The conditions will be deteriorating tomorrow. And by tomorrow night and early Friday, they'll be near their worst along the coast. Florence is expected to produce a nine-foot storm surge in North Carolina and rain totals from a foot to more than three feet in some locations. I'm